all jacked up. We all got all kinds of evil in our heart. And the division in our country, as Al said, it's not a, it's not a drug problem. It's not a race problem. It's a, it's a sin problem. It's a heart problem. So I pray that you would give us some real practical, simple things we can do to look into our own heart, not at the other person, but to ourselves, and, and learn something we can do to bring our own world together and unite, and unite our own world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Give someone a hug next to you. You got a podium? You got a podium? That's okay. That's okay. If, and by the way, if you're, if you're sitting, if you haven't done yet, if you could turn your chair to face this table, just turn your hips if you haven't done that yet. Um, when I was eight, my name is Miles anyway, I'm from New York, I grew up to play uh, with a dream to play in the NFL, did, was drafted to the Los Angeles Rams in 1982, got cut, which means I got fired, which means I didn't get paid, and I came, played here for four years, my first two years I was doing cocaine, started doing cocaine right across the street from the, uh, Marissa, the Legacy Center in the Hanalei Hotel with a couple of uh, uh, players, we went to the room and they put cocaine on the table, I vowed never to do cocaine, and and five minutes later, I was doing cocaine. Two years later, I was doing cocaine. And then uh, we had guys on our team who were all five Christians. And just so you know, the football, the, um, the National Football League is probably the most Christianized sport in America. Just so you know. We have, every team has a chaplain. Every team has Bible study during the week. Every team has chapel the night before the game, Christian and Catholic. Every team prays before the game in the locker room. And every team play, prays after the game at the 50-yard line. You didn't know that? but So don't believe the media. But so we, are, we, we got a lot of dudes that are just like this with God. And so when I, when I, I had guys on my team who were doing Bible study. And I was in the, in the bathroom of our team playing doing cocaine. And I'm walking down the aisle of the plane. And they're in the aisle doing Bible study. And I was an airplane, this is, you know, it's about that wide. These brothers were like this wide, and there was two of them. And they stopped me, asking, what you, you know, you going, to, what's up, little brother? I said, who you calling little? And I looked up as I said that. <laughs> and he says, you. I said, I'm just checking, I'll make sure you were talking to me. And uh, he asked, share the gospel with me. A few weeks, months later, I was in southeast, in this neighborhood, where my, by the way, my son's a cop in this neighborhood. Um, my dad was a cop. Um, in a crack house with my teammates. And then I was on my couch, had been doing cocaine all night, five o'clock in the morning, my heart was pounding out of my chest. And I said, oh Lord, I'm, I'm done. And I stopped doing cocaine that day, April 12th, 1984. Never did cocaine again. And amen, come on now. But I, I wanna take you back to when I was a little kid. Um, when I was eight years old, uh, Martin Luther King was killed. And I remember, uh, it was right after I turned eight, like a, a week after I turned eight, um, I remember what I felt and I remember what I thought. I felt how unfair it was. Because if you weren't back in the 60s, you could see all the black and white TV stuff. It was very divided, um, v very, very divided. Um, you, you would very rarely see a black person on television, if you can believe that. And when Michael Jackson, as a little kid, would come on television, the world would stop just to see someone who looked like you on television. And I remember thinking what, how unfair it is, but I also remember thinking, what can we do? And that has been gnawing at me my whole life. What can we do? I have a brother who played football, also was a quarterback. And when he came out of college, he was, black quarterbacks were not fashionable in the United States. And he was the number one rated passer in the nation, Heisman runner-up, and didn't get drafted to the fifth round. That would not happen today. And so, and all the family scars. So we've seen that, experienced it. And so today I want to talk to you about how we got divided. But more importantly, I'm going to talk to you about how we can come together. Can I get an amen? Everyone say us. us. Say them. Yeah. Say us. us. Say them. Yeah. We live in an us versus them culture. Pastor Valdez talk about set tripping, which is, a, I'm going to add that to my vocabulary. Uh, everybody's set tripping. You're either, you're either black or white, black against white, whoever you are, for or against the police, whoever you are, Mexicans against, y'all can say it, I'm going to call that one out, <laughs> CNN or Fox, whoever you are, Republican or Democrat, for or against the president. The whole world is divided because that's the devil's strategy. The, God's, the number of unity is one. Jesus said, I pray that you shall be one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. God is all about unity. The devil is all about two, division. So he wants to force you to pick a side. I'm going to be on my side, whatever my side is, and it doesn't have to be race or ethnicity. There's only one race. It doesn't have to be ethnicity. 
It's all these other issues that we are on one side against another. And when you get in a conversation with your friends, your family, you walk in your house, you feel like I got to pick one side against another. That is the nature of the devil. Now, here's the spiritual battle. We are the church, so we have to have the answer. As a matter of fact, we, we only have the answer. You're not going to, laws, we need our laws. Absolutely. That's not going to change someone's heart. Only the Holy Spirit can change someone's heart. So I want to talk to you about how we got divided and how we came together. Everyone say us. Versus them. You're, it's one or the other. Then there's, there's a third option. And the third option is that we honor what we have in common because we have more similarities than differences. Now, I'm just going to bring this up once. I wrote a book called The Third Option. It's going to be over there after, but that's all that's in there. All I'm talking about is in here. If you have a phone, turn your phone off because there's going to be some stuff on the, the screens that you can, um, can, can take pictures of. Let me give you a history. When I grew up, I have four, my four grandparents are from Jamaica, West Indies. I have a white grandmother, a Chinese black grandmother, a man from China, Mr. Wong. His name was Wong Kim Fong. They called him Charlie. <laughs> if you, if you, I was on Air China, and this lady, she said, oh, she, uh, they were from China. They lived in China. It's not like they were American. They were from China. And she says, um, uh, I said, what's your name? She says, oh, my name is Hu. <laughs> what is that? See, my name is Hu. But they call me Linda. <laughs> I was like, where'd you get Linda from Hu? <laughs> said, my junior high teacher gave it to me. So my, 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 my great-grandfather is Wong Kim Fong. He came to, China, to Jamaica, West Indies, got jungle fever, and <laughs> thus my grandmother was born. Do we have a picture of my grandmother? I, I, I know we do. I don't know if they're ready. Oh, that's, that's not my grandmother. <laughs> Let's see if they, oh, there's my grandma. She, she fine, huh? She fine. <laughs> don't be cool with my grandma, man. <laughs> So, so, so my, my grandmother and then um, uh, my white grandmother from Jamaica was sent from Jamaica to West Indies to Jamaica, Queens, New York. So she wouldn't marry a black Jamaican. Have you ever been to Jamaica, Queens, New York? <laughs> There's brothers there, right? So she, she ends up going to Jamaica, Queens, meeting my grandfather who, when he went to her house as they were dating, could not go in the front door. He would have to go around the back door. I think we got a picture of them. And w when they got married... Her family disowned her. They lived 15 minutes away. She lived a half mile from me. So I grew up with her. They lived, her family lived 15 minutes away. I never met any of them. Never heard of them. Didn't even know they existed. We just knew there was all these light-skinned brown people and Grandma Dorothy who was white. I grew up in a black neighborhood, went to school in a white neighborhood for the first eight years of my life in a Catholic school, which was right over a street called Ocean Avenue. And I got harassed in the white neighborhood because I was black. I got harassed in the black neighborhood because I wasn't black enough. <laughs> Racism don't discriminate. Discrimination don't discriminate. Are you following what I'm saying? Everyone say us. us. Say them. Yeah. I want to tell you an us versus them story out of the Bible to give a foundation to this because it's an amazing story in the Bible. It says in John, Joshua chapter 5 verse 13. It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him said, and said to him, are you for us? Anyone say us? us. Or them? Yes. Now watch this. He says, are you for us? Our adversaries. The Jews, just, the exodus just happened. They're getting ready to go into the promised land. And Joshua's leading him into the promised land. And, he's, and as he's going to the promised land, this big seven-foot ripped up angel with a sword drawn in his hands. And he's standing there. And Joshua says to him, are you for us? Anyone say us? us. Say them. Yes. Now Joshua says, are you for us or our adversaries? I'm going to tell you something. Whoever's not your us is your enemy. If you, I don't, whatever, whatever political side you're on, it don't matter. The other people's the enemy. And whatever, whatever I don't want to say set you claim ethically, it's like if you, if you have those racial issues, if, you, if this, these are my people, then those people are your enemy. And so he's saying, listen, if you, and Joshua said to the angel, if, if they're not for us, they're against us. Now, you have to understand, you, listen, you have to understand this so you can get the next part. He's saying to the angel, which is Jesus, the angel of the, of the command of the, of the armies of the Lord, are you for us or adversaries? In other words, us, we're the good people. Those are the bad people. Those are our enemies. Look what, it got, look what, look what 
The angel says, now before I read it, I want you to, I want you to start thinking about who's your us and who's your them. Who is your those people? The media will tell you. I'll get to that in a few minutes. He says, the command of the Lord's army says, no. Let me read it again. Are you for us or adversaries? He says, no. That's not the answer. You want, my, my, my kids, I'll ask them, especially when they're little, you want some ice cream? They go, sure. No, it's either yes or no. If it's sure, I'm going to eat it all. You ain't getting any, okay? So be clear. Be clear. Declare what you want. So he says, are you for us or our enemies? Because if you're not on our side, you must be our enemies. And he says, no. He, I, I, what's the answer? He says, you only gave me two options. You didn't give me the two. There's a third option. So I'm not picking either one of your options. He says, no, but as command of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face and worshiped. And he says, what does my Lord, servant say, the Lord say to my servant? The commander of the army of the Lord says, take off your sand off your foot for the place where you stand is holy ground. He said, listen, Joshua, if you are going to take the promised land, this promised land thing or this unity thing, it ain't your idea. It has to be done my way. This is, this is my idea. This is my land. You have to do it my way. And so first what you have to understand is you have to take off your shoes and start worshiping because this is going to be done my way. Um, there are different rules in the kingdom of God. As believers, we have to live by different rules. We have to live by the rules of the word of God and the spirit of God. So when he said take off your shoes, he says, listen, you are staying on different property. If you ever go to a different country and you see the U.S. embassy in that country, if you go into the gate, if you go to London, let's say, in the UK, and you go to, to the U.S. Embassy, and you go into the gate of the U.S. Embassy, see, you are now in the United States. You are no longer in that city. So he said, you are no longer in, in Jericho right now. You are in heaven right now. So take your shoes off, for this is holy ground. And now that you're standing on this holy ground, you have to do it my way. Here's a third option. And the third option is that we honor what we have in common. We all are made in the image of God. Every single person in this planet. It's made in the image of God. You all bleed red. You have lungs. You have a heart. You have legs. You have feet. You have, you have a thought. You have dreams. You have passions. You want to have relationships. Can I get an amen? It says all that you have in common, but you're so focused on one thing that's different, two things that are different, three things that are different. He said that's not how we're going to do this. And so when we go into the promised land, Joshua, we're going to do this my way, and miracles are going to happen. If we, if we, the church, say, Lord, we're going we're gonna to love like you say to love. We're going to forgive like you say to forgive. We're going to see people like you tell us to see people. Miracles will happen. But if we just do the same old thing that, that, that's not the spirit led, nothing's going to change because our churches are segregated. 85% of houses of worship are segregated. Guess what that means? We ain't doing it right yet. We ain't doing it right. So we have to start here. We, don't have, we can't worry about out there if we ain't doing it right. So I'm going to talk to you about how we got divided. Actually, I was, I was in Donovan State Prison ministering, and there's a field in it, the prison yard. If you all have never been to prison, uh, uh, well, I'm in spiritual outreach. So like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> y'all know the deal. Y'all know the deal. I'm in the yard. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I, just finished, I just finished speaking. And, you know, the whites are over there, the blacks are over there, the Hispanics are over there, and everyone's divided. And these three white supremacists are walking around the yard. They had no shirt on. One dude was here, and the other two dudes, they couldn't even stand next to him. They were behind him. And they're walking around the yard, basically saying, white is right, brown get down, black get back. <laughs> Never heard that one, huh? <laughs> Write that down. <laughs> And I'm, I'm standing and I'm looking at these dudes walk around and, and everyone's just watching them and they're just, you know. And God said, go talk to them. So there was, a, there was a yellow line on the ground that was the limit to where we can go as non-inmates. I went up to the line and as they came by, I said, called the dude over and that was in the front. And he came right here. Now he had no shirt on. So he said, what's up? And before I can answer him, I was almost chuckled because he had so much ink from his tattoos that he was black. It's like, brother, you're defeating the purpose. <laughs> so we, we had a couple words, exchanged a couple words. Uh, but what we didn't realize even at the time is that we are 99.5% genetically identical. Yeah. That every person you ever meet is 99.5% genetically identical. He was a genetic mirror just about, wow. except for 
this. Now, he's been told all this stuff in his head. we all been told about people. And it's the devil's ploy to divide us and keep us divided. Amen? So how do we get divided? Sociologists call it, they call set tripping grouping. Same term. They call set tripping grouping. All of us are in multiple groups. Whether you, whether you, uh, whether you self-volunteer uh, uh, into a group or you just realize you're in a group. For example, all you ladies are a group. All the ladies say, hey, yeah. that's a group. All those fellows, we are not in that group by birth. It's just that you, it's not whether you want to be in that or not. You're not in that group. If you're a mother, say, hey, yeah. that's a tired group because they have different experiences. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, hey. <laughs> and if you have young kids when they get older, it don't get any better. <laughs> Uh, so, so, so all you guys are a group, all you senior pastors are a group, all you musicians are a, pro- are a group, all you employed are a group, unemployed are a group, law enforcement's a group. Okay, and then every group, if, if you are part of a group, that's called in-group. Everyone say in-group. That's my in-group. These are my people who are like me. Us. They are like me. Anybody not in that particular group is called your out-group. Say out-group. That's set tripping. These are, my, these are people who are like me. These people are not like me. And by the way, once you understand and grow up with a group, whatever your group is, there's a thing called the homogeneity effect, which you understand the variations of your group. For example, people who don't, I'm learning Spanish, so I'm, I'm getting to know uh, uh, the different variations of Spanish. Mexicans speak Spanish different than Puerto Ricanos and Cubanos. But if you don't have any idea, you think all Spanish is the same and all Hispanics are the same. But if you understand and you are in that group, you will say, no, that, 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 there's so many different variations. We, matter of fact, we had a, we had a Spanish service uh, uh, that I preached at and we had 15 countries there. So there's all different variations of, your, of different groups. But if that's not your group, that's your out group, you generalize all of them and put them all in one package. That's called stereotyping. And we stereotype because we don't know, because we're ignorant. We have ignorance. And so we say all police are this, and all pastors are this, and all megachurch pastors are this. We stereotype because we don't know what the heck we're talking about. And they could even be part of our group. You could, you could even be like an athlete of one sport, and you're stereotyping about an athlete of another sport when you live out the same life. And so you have to understand, if someone's in your out group, you do not know about them. You just don't. Oh, the, the people south of eight are going to talk about the people north of eight and vice versa. But if, unless you met them and hung out with them, you simply don't know. You may have a little anecdotal information from one friend, two friends, five friends. That don't mean you know anything. It's like, it's like, it's like two women who, are, who have had babies. They got, they got kids. The kids are five, six, seven, eight year old. And they were sitting around talking. And then a lady comes over, a young lady, a young single woman comes over. Not single. She just got married. And she says... Uh, Pastor, Pastor Valdez's wife is pregnant, but it's not that first. Where's Pastor Valdez's wife? Santa Sandoval, Sandoval. Sandoval. Five, I'm, I'm getting almost five. Five. Five kids. But so, so if you, your wife is standing around and this young lady comes over, she never had a baby. She just got pregnant. And she goes, oh, I'm going to have a baby, and I'm going to do a hair, and we're going to have fun and play dolls all day, and it's just going to be so much fun, and we're, and we're going to go out shopping. And the, the women with the babies, they're like, you ain't got no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> my, we look at pictures of my wife. Her hair, she had glasses this big, her hair was jacked. And we look at these pictures, and we say, that was the 90s. <laughs> the whole decade of the 90s, she was like that. Because our kids were born, boom, 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 r- uh, right back at back at back. But if you have never been there, you have no clue of what you're talking about. So your out group, you just don't know. So anytime you hear yourself talking about some out group or your family or friends talk about an out group, one of the questions you should ask them is, do you have firsthand information? That has been validated over and over and over and over again. And if they say no, you need to say, you need to, you need to, matter of fact, let's go meet some of those people and, and test your theory. So once you have your out group and in group, once you have your in group, you express in group bias. You might want to take a picture of this. In group bias. I'm a, in group bias means that people who are in my group, I'm going to treat this way. People who are out my group, I'm going to treat this way. So if you, if you, if you guys are Charger fans and, a, and a, Charger, a guy walks in the building, you have no idea who he is. 
Like he, and he's average looking like me. He's not like a big, big dude where you might suspicious, suspect something. But he's average, my size, and, and you just kind of ignore him. And then he tells you he plays for your favorite team. All of a sudden, you missed a nice guy. <laughs> hey, hey, come over, take a picture, <laughs> go date my wife. <laughs> you know, it's kind of nonsense, right? That's called in-group bias. And guess what? You can turn it on like that. Hello. You just do it. You can do it. You know what? You can love people that you have nothing in common with just like that. And you can hate people and be suspicious of people who are not like you just like that. It's your decision. I don't care what your parents told you. It's straight up your decision. So look at this list. Um, This is called uh, in-group bias. I am more comfortable with those who are like me. I'm more inclined to spend time socially with those who are like me. I'm more patient with those who are like me. I give the benefit of the doubt quicker to those who are like me. I express more grace when mistakes are made by those who are like me. It is easier to communicate with those who are like me. I assume I will get along easier. I am more willing to go out of my way to help those who are like me. And ooh, the, the number nine is powerful. I possess more positive assumptions about those who are like me. So as soon as I identify you as like me, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt of all that. Now, as soon as I identify you as like me, whether it's ethnically, career, neighborhood, I can go on and on about all the things we have in common with people. But as soon as I identify that, this is probably most likely how I'm going to treat you versus what I'm going to show you the opposite. Now, you may say, well, I'm sure most of us in here have experienced racism. That's exactly what it feels like. If you haven't, that's what it feels like. And more. Here's the opposite. Someone not in your group. I am less comfortable with those who are not like me. I am less inclined to spend time socially with those who are not like me. I am less patient with those who are not like me. I give the benefit of the doubt to less to those who are not like me. I express less grace when mistakes are made by those who are not like me. It's more difficult to communicate with those who are not like me, so I don't even want to try. I don't assume I will get along, so I ain't going to hang out with you. I am less willing to go out of my way to help you, and I possess less positive assumptions about those who are not like me. My assumptions about you, whether they're a lot or a little, have nothing to do with you and everything to do with me. And if I have, if I have bad assumptions about you, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to hesitate. I'm going to avoid you. I ain't going to talk to you. I'm going to make the conversation quick. I ain't gonna, I'm not going out of my way for you. It's all right here. It's all right here. And it's based on my, my assessment that you are not in my group. It's all about me. That's my, that's my issue. And, and, I, and I, I would just challenge all of you as you walk, and we'll get, to this, get some solutions in a minute, as you go to work, church, the mall, just keep asking yourself, what do I think about that person? What do I think about that person? Is that person like me? Is that person like me? Let me tell you this. Every single person, you, you can create reasons, valid reasons that everybody is your in-group. Everybody. You, 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 may, you, may have, you may have grown up in a wealthy neighborhood and, and never seen a police car in your neighborhood except to get a kid out the tree, and, and that's not your world. And you go to prison, and this brother had been his fifth generation criminal, crackhead. He's your in group. He's your in group. Made in the image of God, called by God, has an ability to communicate with God, love God, walk with God, has dreams, passions. A desire to have a family and love just like you. Breathe air in, CO2 out, got blood, bones, muscle. You, you, every single person. And if you just in your head go, that person's in my in-group, that person's in my in-group, that person. And then when your cousins try to tell you they're not, you say, no, 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 I'm not doing that. That's a, that's a conscious decision. So I'm going to give you six things to do. Six, if you want to write them down, write them down. Number one, acknowledge that you have blind spots. <laughs> a blind spot is that you don't really know what you don't know. This was the scariest thing I ever did, almost. Uh, it probably was scary because it lasted so long to write it. And because ever since I was a little kid, I've been arguing racism. And it didn't hit me until I was well into this book that there are a lot of people who don't believe that they can be racially offensive without being a racist. I'm going to say it this way. Of course people are racial, racist and, of course, racism offensive. But there are some people who will offend you race, racially and they're not necessarily racist. In other words, they don't necessarily have something against you. They're just ignorant. They're trying to be funny when they, they, don't, they don't have a sense of humor. 
And, 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 when, and because they can't separate those two things, when you say that they're racially offensive, they assume that you are saying that they're racist. Now, maybe you are, but I'm just saying. When you say they're racially offensive and you try to educate them, because they can't separate those two things, they can't get educated. Because if they admit that this isn't wrong, to them, they're admitting they're racist. Are you following what I'm saying? So um, let me say the point again. You have to believe you can be racially offensive and not be racist. Every single person on the planet. You could be racist to yourself. It's called internalized racism. People have told you long enough that your people are less than or superior and you believe it. And so you start expressing that towards people who are like you and yourself. And so, so you, all of us have the ability to have blind spots. There was a, there's a, a leadership coach here in San Diego named Stephen Jones, and he wrote, wote an article called The Right Hand of Privilege. How many of y'all are right-handed? Raise your hand. If you're right-handed, raise your hand like elbow above the ear, just so I can see all your hands. Okay, keep your hand up just one second. Look around the room. It's, it's like 90% of y'all. Okay? The world was made by you for you. That's a fact. The world was made by you for you. I'm going to tell you why in a minute. How many of y'all left-handed? I'm left-handed. We're, we're, and by the way, left, let's say, come on now. What's up? Come on. We're left-handed. Yeah. Now keep your hand up for a second. Keep your hand up for a second. Watch this. That's my in-group. She's my in-group. He's my in-group. He's my, my in-group is very diverse on the outside. Okay. So here's the deal. We, we have a disadvantage over you right-handed people. And y'all, the right-handed people, you created the disadvantage, and you don't even know you have the advantage. When you were in school, your desk was over here. And you got the right and talked to the girl next to you because your elbow was braced, so you didn't have to look where you were writing. Us lefties, we're out here in space. Hold, hold up, girl. I got to do this. And you right didn't even know it. You don't even know it. You don't even know how blessed you are. You, if, you, if you're a golfer, you can go to any golf shop and get any club, any driver, first time. We got to drive around. If you, if you want to play catch with your daughter or your son, the catcher's mitt, you can get a catcher's mitt in any sporting goods store. There has never been a left-handed catch in the World Series in the history of baseball. Not, not because of this issue I'm talking about. It's just so rare. So when, if I was to get a catcher's mitt for me, right, on, for this hand, I would have to go store to store or order on Amazon. But when I was a kid, the only Amazon was in Brazil. There was no Amazon. <laughs> so while you're home catching the baseball with your kid, I'm driving around, and you're like, what's taking you so long? I got mine. You must be making it up. You must have made that. You, you really can't not find a glove because I found mine in five minutes. So you must be making it up. You can't get a job, you must be making it up. I got a job. It's called right privilege. You don't even know you have the advantage. Now, does it mean that right-handed people are against left-handed people? Not necessarily. But if you're right-handed and you have these advantages, what would be the godly thing to do is ensure that the left-handed person has the same advantage you have. Are you, are you feeling what I'm saying? Number two. Uh, rename those people to brother, sister, or neighbor. Um, the greatest commandment in the Bible is to love God with your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor. Everyone say neighbor. neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. I'm going to say it every time. The, the greatest commandment is to love God with your heart, mind, and soul, and love your what? As yourself. This is, Jesus said, if you don't do this, stop. Don't sing worship. Don't preach. Don't, don't be saying you're an elder. Don't be saying you're an usher. This is what you need to do. Can I get an Amen. Now, I'm not saying we do it perfectly, but that has to be right here in front of us every day, right? I have to love my neighbor as myself. So why is our church so jacked up? And by the way, we do accept that our church got issues. Can I, can I, okay. So why, why is that? Because we created a loophole to that verse. Can you put the verse up? Do we have the verse, uh, uh, Jeremy? I'm going to show you the loophole. If we have the verse. Okay. Don't have the verse. I'll wait three seconds. One. Okay, I'll read it. Hey! You have heard it say you shall love, uh, love the Lord, your God, you shall love your neighbor and your hate your enemy. Okay, it's a different one, but it'll work. We change this word. We decide that that person's not my neighbor. 
So if that person is my adversary or those people or those white blank, those black blank, those illegals, as soon as I give them a label less than neighbor, I dehumanize them, I don't got to love them. Because God said I have to love my neighbor. But if you ain't my neighbor, I don't need to love you. We do that every day. We walk in the mall. Oh, that ain't my neighbor. That ain't my neighbor. That ain't my neighbor. I ain't gonna, I'm not going to assume the worst of them because we, we create this. We, we rewrite the Bible. Place on every person you meet the label neighbor. I'm serious. When you're driving down the street, you see someone's eating out of the garbage can. Say, God, that is my neighbor. That's my neighbor. See, someone has nothing to do with you, as I said before. Their world is so separate from yours. That is my neighbor. You know that your brain, human brains are designed to f- come up with solutions for everything. Take a, a little tangent here. If you tell yourself, why don't I fit in, your brain will tell you. It will create reasons. You don't fit in because you're too tall. You don't fit in because you're too short. You don't fit in because you're too dark, because you're too light. They don't fit in because you're living in. They'll, it'll just make stuff up, and then you will believe it because your brain told you. Are you following what I'm saying? So if you, if, you, if you ask your brain a question or direct your brain to do something, it will do it. Now, what if you said, Lord, uh, brain, show me my neighbors. Show me how everybody I meet is in my in-group. It will show you. Put the word, the label neighbor on everybody you meet. Number three, give in-group love to your out-group. Hey, you walk in a room and there are people not in your group. Hey, the police officers, you're not a cop. How many of y'all are not cops? Okay, give the, give the cops some love. How many of y'all are not F- law enforcement? FBI, we got FBI here. <laughs> FBI, right? You see someone that's not in your group, you walk in a room, there's a whole bunch of guys in the room, and one young lady, go and make her feel comfortable. You walk in a room, it's all Hispanics and there's one black dude, one white dude, or vice versa. Hey, be the one to go out and love. You know the Bible says love your, love your friend and hate your enemy. Love your friend and hate your out group. Love your in group. Uh, acknowledge your brother and sister's color. I remember the first time someone told me they didn't see my color. I thought they had an eye stigmatism. And I was like... That's, that's messed up. You don't see red, green, blue. And I said, no, no, I see that. I just don't see your color. Um, the, the brain processes 10 million bits of information a second. And 90% of the information in, coming to your brain is from your eye. Your eye sees motion, depth, shape, movement, and color. You can't not see color. Even if you close your eyes, you will see black. You can't not see color. I was watching, I, I was listening, uh, talking to this girl one day. She, she went to Hawaii and got a tan because she was trying to get this guy to call her up. And she, she went out there laid seven hours in the sun to get brown, which is somewhat comical to brown people. Uh, <laughs> so she came back. She had a little spaghetti strap. And she was boop, boop, thrown in his face, bad work, boop, boop. And he wasn't calling her. So she was complaining to me like, I'm going to do something about it. And I, and, and, and she, but she was thinking, I went and laid out for seven days and got all this nice brown color, and he don't even acknowledge it. It's amazing how when people go to Hawaii we, we, and get a tan in Hawaii, they'll celebrate it. <laughs> but when we get a tan right here, we invalidate it. It's just brown. I was listening to uh, the great theologian philosopher, Fred G. Sanford. Can I get an amen? Y'all, y'all don't. Who doesn't know Fred G. Sanford? Anybody not know who Fred G. You don't? No, who does not know who Fred G. Sanford is? Okay, Red Fox. The young people in the back here. Red Fox. Do you know Sanford's son? Yeah, there you go. That's it. That's it. So Fred G. got robbed and the police come over, the black cop and the white cop come over and tell him, you know, about the perpetrator and you're getting the information from him. They said, Fred G. Sanford, was the perpetrator colored? He goes, yeah, he was colored white. You know white's a color? If you go to the dictionary and look up colors, or if you look up white, I'll tell you it's color. Again, the devil, white people, people of color. White people aren't colored. Sure they are. It's colored white. Matter of fact, I think white people, and basically this is what Fred G. said in another episode, that white people are more colored than anybody. Why? In the springtime, they're white. (laughs) 
Summertime, some turn brown, some turn red. <laughs> when it gets cold, they turn blue. <laughs> That's four colors right there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> we get burgundy. <laughs> the devil says, no, 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 no. You got you to you separate those two groups. Culture has separated. Pain, history has separated us. But in reality, it's just a shade of brown. It's called melanin. We're all colored with this melanin. It's called brown. That's why when you lay in the sun, the, the sun activates the melanin. That's how you get a tan. And for all you don't know, black people tan too. Number five, view every conversation as a race consultation. Um, I, there was a, a police officer actually who came to our church, and he came in the back room with his wife. And the whole time was, he, he was white, and his wife was, I don't know. She was Filipino, black, something. And we're talking, talking, and I'm thinking, what is she? And usually I'll just straight up ask, but I just happen to not get around to it. But I was like, what is she? What is she? What? I, was trying to, I was trying to pick it up from a conversation. And when she left, I said, my wife, what do you think she was? Every person you talk to, you are having a race conversation. I don't care who you talk to. You could be talking to someone who's the same ethnicity as you. You are having a race conversation. What does that mean? Is that when you look, if you're white and you look at a white person, they are either affirming what you think about people like you or they are challenging what you think about people like you. If you're black talking to someone black, they are either affirming what you think black people should sound like or they are challenging it. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I told you, you ain't really black. Why? Because I'm challenging what you think black people are. Same thing about Hispanics. And so anytime you talk to somebody, you are having a race conversation and you are either having them affirm what you believe about them or it's being challenged. It is a race conversation, but you should turn it into a race consultation. What is that? Is that when you talk to somebody, you let them reveal to you what they are. Instead of you opposing on them what you assume. Now, because we all assume stuff right away. I got a guy in our church named Taz. He's a former white supremacist. Tattoos all over his body include his whole face. And he was a white supremacist for a long time. He is a dear friend today. Goes to church every Sunday. I interviewed him, I interviewed him at church on our stage, I don't know, four months ago. And my wife is sick, and so he texts me. He said, tell Debbie, you know, I'm praying for her, whatever. And she said, oh, he's a big, big, big teddy bear. Because if you saw him, you would instantly say, I'm going on the other side of the street. But you don't know. You don't know, you, you, don't, you don't know his story. You don't know what's placed in his head. You don't know where he's come from, what he's been through. Race consultation. Let me understand. I was, I was at a golf course and I was walking from my car to, to the club or to, from the club to the car. And this kid drives by, white kid, groomed, 25 years old. He picks me up in the car. He says, you want to ride? He worked there. He had his little shorts on, little shirt. So just, you got that kid's picture? Like, you know, Mr. Hollywood looking. I said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Iowa. I said, cool, what's your name? DeAndre. <laughs> Don't judge. See, why you're laughing, here's why you're laughing. Because you would not assume that dude, you had a race conversation. You had a race conversation. Not only did you have a race conversation when you pictured him, you had another one when you heard his name. Because then you saw a brother with his pants sagging. You say, wait, wait, how did that happen? I, same thing I said. How did you get that name? Did your mom have like a boyfriend or something? I mean, what was your, he, said, he said, my parents just like that name. Now, once he said his name was DeAndre, here's what happened to me. My assumptions about him changed just because of his name. I was saying, You're, you must be cool. <laughs> <laughs> And, I, and I, I felt endeared to this kid whose name was DeAndre. Can you imagine in Iowa, why I came walking to school, hey, what's up? He said, what's your name? Oh, my name is DeAndre. It's like, what? <laughs> Every time you meet somebody, give them opportunity to s disclose to you their story because you don't know it. You just don't know. And lastly, give your heart to those who are not like you. Um, Rod Carew is a Panamanian baseball player. Matter of fact, how many of y'all know Rod Carew? Very few. How many of y'all don't know Rod Carew? Okay, Rod Carew was a Panamanian baseball player when I was a kid. He was one of my heroes. He played 18 years in the, in the major leagues. 
uh, MVP, rookie of the year, 18-year uh, All-Star, 328 batting average. He was just amazing. Uh, three, four years ago, he had a heart condition, needed a heart transplant, and a kidney. Same time, at the same time, a white NFL player, Conrad Rulin, had a brain aneurysm, went into a coma, and died. Conrad signed his organs over to be donated. His heart and kidney went to Rockaroo. Wow. When Conrad was 11 years old, he met Rockaroo. Came home and told his mother, I met my hero. I'm going to play a, a professional sports. So now his heart and kidney are in his hero's body. So his mother calls up Rockaroo and says, you have my son's heart and kidney. I don't know how she found out, but this is a true story. And you could go on to ESPN 30 for 30 and look it up. They'll show you, you'll be bawling crying. He says, you have my son's heart and kidney. And he says, do you want to come listen to your son's heart? She goes over his house. And she listens to his son, her son's heart in his body. If we are so different and, you know, <laughs> superior people, inferior people, these people shouldn't be with those people. How is this white kid going to give his heart and kidney to this Panamanian guy? We just got to ask the Holy Spirit to open our eyes that we may see how similar we all are. And just make a decision. We are going to be different. And we are going to claim everybody as our in group. If you ever meet somebody that says everybody's their friend, that's exactly what they're doing. It's really that simple. You can make everybody your friend just by assuming that, the, and by the way, the differences that we do have actually enhance our life. They're not a threat to us. They're actually a benefit to us. So thank you for the Peace Coalition. And by the way, there's no light-skinned brothers on your, on your board, so can I get <laughs> I'm like, that dude black, that dude doesn't matter. Where's the, where's the high yellow brothers? <laughs> Thank you for the Peace Coalition. Thank you for what you're doing. And thank all of you for being a part of it. And can I get an amen? Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you so much for your faithfulness. Dear God, man, we have an opportunity and a responsibility with that opportunity to love our neighbor as ourselves. We have a responsibility before that to label everyone as our neighbor. So I pray of all the things this coalition is going to do, that this idea of living out the third option and leaning into our similarities would be woven all through all what we do. And that people would learn it from them, but also see it modeled by them. And that as diverse as San Diego is, that this idea of loving our neighbor would knit us all together, all over. Thank you for Pastor Al. Thank you for the coalition board. Thank you for the community partners. And thank you for what you're going to do through this meeting today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Pastor Miles, we love you. How many thank God for him? He's been leading the way for many years. Thank you. Love you very much. Can you stand? I want to thank everybody for spending your morning with us. I hope and pray you felt at home. It was great to see Pastor Miles, all of the leadership that was here today. Also, it's good to have Cornerstone Church with us here this morning as well. Pastor Georgina and her team. Listen, on May 30th, we're gathering together because we want to see lives change in the city of San Diego. And if you can take that piece of paper, write your phone number down right there on that paper on your table. We're going to be doing